What is up, hotties? Welcome back to another episode of Stay Hot. I'm Bladen Kirk, joined as always by my two favorite co-hosts of all time in Matthew Sponauer and Theo Ash. We have a great episode planned for you all today where we will break down all the NFL trades and news ton went on this week and we have a special guest who covers the seattle seahawks mr griffin sturgeon but before we get into all of that matt theo how are you guys doing today bad (laughs) bad (laughs) as a lifelong bears fan it's a tough day for me here um no i'm doing good i'm in seattle i'm in a hostel uh and a hostel is for those who don't know is when you're in a hotel room with multiple people like staying all together and so everybody is gone right now, but at any moment, a total stranger could walk in on this recording. And if they do, they are, they get to be a guest on the Stay Out <laughs> podcast, I guess. So uh, Seattle's so, cool, though. Uh, so, we, so what your takeaway from this is, if you want to be a guest on the Stay Out podcast, just stay in a bunch of hostels until you eventually stay in the one that Theo's staying in. Yeah, yeah. Come, come bounce around Seattle until you find the right hostel that I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, pretty much. You know the drill. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's no one's birthday. I don't think any special holidays are coming up, but subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, We would greatly appreciate it. Uh, Keep helping grow the podcast on YouTube, of course. Well, I think it's about high time we welcome the man of the hour, Mr. Griffin Sturgeon, Seahawks analyst. And he actually has a podcast of his own called Seattle Overload. So when you're done listening to this one, of course, go and listen to his podcast where Gives you the lowdown on the Seattle on Seattle. Um, you know, I think I'll just let you introduce yourself at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, my yeah. reputation does not pre- precede me. Actually, uh, I'm just one of many uh, hyper enthusiastic um, uh, existers out on the internet talking about football. So, um, yeah, I <laughs> got a little podcast, uh, done some some moderate mild blogging, nothing too crazy. Uh, but yeah, I, my primary focus is, is, um, Seahawks stuff, you know, have a general interest in the broader, um, happenings of the league. But, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm here to talk about, um, the, the, the big news that, that just happened. (laughs) Right. The big, the big news. Um, it it is great to have you on and, you know, great to have someone Seahawks on to talk about it because I'm, I'm sure Seattle, little bit bittersweet, Right, you want to see those guys, you know, and I think they're both like proud to be Seahawks at this point, and they're. I know they both, you know, kind of said it's all love, sure, from them. So, but I know it has to feel at least a, it has to sting. Oh a yeah, I like I like the idea of, of, of Russ coming out and being like, I hate. This. I, know. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> no love. I, I, I kind of want that. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> the, because you, you can't hate him now. You can't. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing. So he's really, and credit to him, I don't fault him for it, but he's really good at, you know, making it look like, you know, plausible deniability of him not wanting out. He was, he didn't have a choice. Um, but I think at the same time, like he probably has made a lot of inroads in the, in the area. So I think some of it's genuine. Uh, but, you know, Russ is a politician yeah. for better or worse. So he, he was always going to play it this way, no matter what the circumstances were. But yeah, bittersweet is a is a good term. I think a majority of the fan base is just pissed off that they don't have their star quarterback anymore. <laughs> there, well, th- th- there's a vocal well, minority that has mixed feelings about it. But I'd say the majority of us are, are are not happy. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Seattle right now uh, for vacation here, and I walk around the city, and everybody's murder murmuring and muttering <laughs> under their breath, like, "Oh, I got Rosagon." I hear it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> not really but well i think my first sorry but my first question is like yeah. looking at russ over the past like year and a half and looking at maybe a little bit of a, a dip in in production and a dip in play and probably playing the worst football of his career over the last year and a half i would maybe say um i know you've done watched a lot of film on the seahawks and russ and games and do you think that that is kind of a small sample size fluke or do you think like Russ is got flaws and as age kind of creeps in, he's just kind of not in the peak of his career anymore? Do you think he can yeah, it's, turn it around? Because he's had like turn it around is a little bit harsh because he's been a good quarterback. Sure. But like, what do you think about like the quality of his play and what he's bringing, I guess, to the Broncos at this stage in his yeah, career? Yeah, it's, it's a complicated question, especially trying to view the last year and a half. I think first 
you should anyone should try to remove like what is related to the injury. I mean, he fucked up his finger, pardon my language, um, right. in the middle of the season last year. And then when he came back, he was not 100%. Um, so I, I do my best to try to eliminate those games. And I kind of identify the, um, the 49ers game, I think week 13 this past year, when I thought, oh, Russ is back. Um, and then he had a couple of bad games after that point, uh, against the, the, the Bears and the Rams. Um, and you think, well, is it the finger again or is it just general downward, downward turn? But the way I view those two games is that he could have not have injured his finger and had same regular rust season and still had those bears and Rams games performances. And I chalked that up. I chalked that up to just him running into matchup problems. It's just coincidental that it came after this, this big injury and people kind of group it all together. Um, as far as, as far as the stretch preceding that, the obviously in 2020 first half of the season lights out MVP candidate in the second half of the season, he's like, bottom like late teens uh bottom 10 almost and in, in, in a lot of efficiency metrics over that period so people go well, is he is he declining it's a natural question but he's had an eight game stretch like that about three times in his career so that's not th- that's not completely out of like the norm i thought going into 2021 he could just as easily bounce back and have something close to the first half of 2020 again in the first five games before he injured himself there were some issues, but I mean, he was fairly efficient, efficient enough to win games with. So really the way I view Russ is that I don't think he's necessarily declining, at least as a passer. I think he's been the same quarterback he's been ever since his rookie year. I think he's been one of those guys that came out for his style of play with a very high floor and then he didn't really improve, but that's both a compliment and a criticism that just shows how game ready he was. Like there, there's not a huge portion of his game, like his development as a passer that improved, but nothing's gotten worse either. The rest is just kind of team circumstances year to year, kind of dictating the rest. So I think Broncos fans should be excited. I mean, you got Russell Wilson. That's not Drew Locke. That's not Teddy Bridgewater. I know, I know Teddy put up a fight. Um, you know, we'll never know what really could have been with him if he didn't get injured early in his career. But, you know, they got three receivers. They lost Noah Fant, but they've got three exciting receivers. And I know they drafted another one. So, yeah, go throw for 4,500 yards. You know, you've got, you've got a puncher's chance against the, uh, the other teams in that division. I don't know if I would put, you know, bet on the Broncos, but you have a chance. You're going to at least win 10 games, I would think. Um, so it's my view of Russ is that he really isn't regressing. He's the same guy he's always been minus, you know, you can't run zone read with him anymore. Um, people say, well, he's a less elusive now. It's like, but his production outside of the pocket on scrambles, not like rollouts, has actually always been sinusoidal year to year. So he's had years where he's been bad outside of the pocket statistically, even when he was, you know, 25, 26. So really, I think he's the same guy. And the rest is just team circumstances that dictates how how far you can go. Um, his, his career reminds me, his arc reminds me a lot of Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers, like the ring early and then like elite elite play and like i think of i mean seahawks twitter was at the forefront of the of the russes or the rogers is you know not the guy he was and like yeah. there's that stretch <laughs> in his career where he was he was not very like analytically and like with the production he was like for years like 2015 to until like 2020 he had that dip in production and then he went to lafleur and nathaniel hackett and that system kind of turned him back into and not all that system. There were some other things that changed, but like he was able to just become once again a hyper efficient quarterback and the throwaways and the bad sacks and, and things kind of disappeared. And I feel like Russ with bad sacks and with like maybe trying to do a little bit too much all the time is a similar thing. And I wonder if Hackett is going to, do you think Hackett and his system? can do for Russ what it did for Rodgers or is that is like Russ a little bit different than Rodgers and maybe won't be able to run that system as efficiently? So I think that is the ultimate question, even from a neutral perspective, because, you know, you have 10 years of data with Russ in Seattle. And, you know, as you just said, you've got, you know, a decade plus of Rodgers in Green Bay. But Seattle did things a certain way. And I'm not just speaking in broad strokes with like pass rates and run rates. Um, like every quarterback 
every quarterback year to year for the most part, even if as they change coordinators, if it, their, the, the macro structure of their offense, um, it, it tends to look the same. And this is a really reductive way of looking at it, but I think it's the, the quickest way to illustrate the point. I mean, as we know, there's play action, there's pure dropbacks, right? And then within pure dropbacks, you've got quick game or three step concepts, five step, seven step, et cetera, right? And then within play action, you've got rollouts and pocket play action. So Russ has, I think, the most unique percentage spread of almost any single quarterback. And the reason why I say that is because what his spread is, is, and I'll get to that in a second, it, it's the spread of what you would consider a not very good quarterback, but he's efficient in spite of it. So year in and year out, Russ, like 30% of his pass attempts are quick game. And that's high. And then 5% or uh, excuse me, 20% roughly of his pass attempts are five step concept passing. And five step drops usually make up like the meat and potatoes, the bulk of most teams off offenses. Like it's anywhere from like 40 to 60% for, for a lot of guys. So, and if you think about it, it's, it's like the most, um, like versatile one. Like you can go short and deep with it, full field, half field. I mean, you can hit a fade or you can hit a four yard hitch if you want within a five step concept. Whereas with quick game, three step, you you know, your, your average depth of target is like five yards. Very few guys are can, you know, access the intermediate and quick game consistently. So, and the reason why that is, is because statistically Russ doesn't do well in five step concept passing, but he relative to league average, he's more stable snap to snap and three step passing. So anyone that is essentially what Pete Carroll has done, he's made sure his coordinators understand, okay, here's a laundry list of things that Russ does well statistically in. Here's the things he statistically doesn't do well in. And through three coordinators, they've lived in they've lived in each bucket the same percentage amount. Um, then you look at what Green Bay has done uh, with with Rodgers, with the Fleur. I mean, they do a lot of five step passing. They they do some quick game, um, but most of it's like RPOs. Um, then they also take deep shots. So if so, I'm really curious to see because there's a debate that rages. Well, is it Russ's offense or is it Pete's offense in terms of the macro structure? So we're going to see it uh, with with Denver. Is is Hackett going to try to have a um, comprehensive, expansive drop back passing offense, or is he going to ride and die on the deep ball and then have quick game accent it just so that you're still getting completions? Because you can't I think everyone would agree you can't throw past 20 yards, 20 times a game, like diminishing returns, defenses yeah. are going to adjust to you. So you have to get, um, you have to get completion somewhere. And it's that little stick route or the slant route. So um, the Packers certainly have the personnel to be, you know, a comprehensive drop back passing team. I just don't know if that fits Russ. Um, but that said, while that is inherently a criticism of Russ, what I just said, it's incredible that he has sustained this year to year efficiency with having such a oddly designed offense. But we'll, we'll see what the truth is this year. If Hackett tries it and if it works or if it doesn't, or if he doesn't try it and that will be commentary itself in the last 10 years in Seattle. So. Yeah. I, I know very few quarterbacks like to do that. Um, short, quick timing based, uh, style of play. It's very Montana, very Montana and Walsh esque, in my opinion. I, and I think that's, I don't know. I think only a very, a very few amount of guys can do it. Um, just because you, it does rely so much on timing and trust. And that's why Montana and Rice were so good at it. And, you know, for Russ and, um, to get that, you know, especially with DK, you know, coming in so, so late and for him to catch on so quickly and then lock it all these years. And I think that's why Baldwin stayed so long because he had all that trust with Baldwin. Do you, do you wonder, you know, at this point, what the Seahawks offense is going to look like going forward? Because I think that's the, that's the next big question is like they, cause you, you can't go out and run the same thing you've been running with Drew Locke right. now. Right. And that's, that's assuming Drew Locke's your quarterback, right? You don't, right. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. You, you don't know who your quarterback is going to be. You don't know what kind of offense you're going to run. Where, where's your, yeah, head I, th there? I think um, really the primary objective is, is don't walk backwards. The, the team shouldn't try to walk backwards from the conclusion of we want to run this offense. So let's go find the guy that fits that. I think they need to get the best quarterback available to them and then let the scheme follow from that. I think the Seattle's offensive personnel is versatile enough to accommodate that. 
of course, I think uh, their offensive coordinator, Waldron, who came from the Rams with Jared Goff, I mean, he ran a completely different offense in Seattle than he did. Well, he kind of ran the Russ version of what he did in L.A. Um, I, I think he would ideally say, get me a quarterback similarly styled to Goff, but just better. So, I mean, in the short list available around the league of veterans to him would probably be guys like Cousins, Carr, Tannehill, you know, the, the, uh, the Kirk quarterbacks. Um, and, uh, but he, he probably thinks, well, they're better. They're similar to Goff in style, but better. So he probably thinks that he can replicate success that he had in LA with him, with, um, with Goff, with, uh, with these better quarterbacks. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. If, if Seattle's macro design is drastically different, that too would kind of, uh, further illuminate why Seattle's offense looked the way it did the last decade. So, yeah, the big how, question how is feel, who's under center. How do you feel about the rest of the Seahawks like roster? Cause I'm looking at Denver and I don't think they had a single pro bowler last year and they've got a head coach who's never been a head coach before. And I look at Seattle with DK and Lockett and I guess not Wagner anymore, more, but like Brooks. And it's like, I don't think the move is as like huge of a roster upgrade from Seattle to Denver as people think it is. So I don't know. And like, I don't know. Do you think the Seahawks, there's any way that they contend next year or they're good or they should just totally blow it up and, and rebuild or where are your thoughts on like the rest of the roster outside of quarterback? I, I definitely have a rosier view of Seattle's roster than I'd say most of my you know fellow Seahawks fans and, and uh, analysts. Um, I, I think that I think that if they were to get a quarterback at a certain threshold, they can support pro- at best a, a, a wild card run. Um, I think that in the, the team's eyes, right or wrong, I think that they think their defense is mostly built. They don't need to change guys out so much as they just need to add talent up front. I think they think they have their back seven. Um, and there's not a lot of familiar names. So outsiders would look at that and go, who are these people? Which I understand. Um, and not all of them are proven, even if they've shown flashes or, you know, they played a good month and then got hurt. But I think they think we have their two perimeter corners and DJ Reed, assuming they retain him. That's kind of, that's it all, it all centers on if they actually pay the guys that they need to pay. I think they think they have their two perimeter cor- corners and Trey Brown and DJ Reed, and they have their two safeties and Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams. They have to pay Quandre Diggs from there. I think they're higher on Jordan Brooks than just about anyone. Um, and uh, the, the only real question is what they do at middle linebacker. Now that Bobby's gone uh, in his place, the last two games because Bobby ended the season hurt was Cody, uh, Cody Barton. And I don't know how good Cody can be, um, for a full season, but I do know that he was significantly better than Wagner this past year in those two games, two games is a very small sample size. So you can't just assume it's a foregone conclusion that, Oh, he's the Mike, but he has cover skills. He had good coverage tape in college at Utah. Um, run defense is a little suspects more so taking on contact than actually keeping his feet in the right place. He is on the lighter side, um, but that shouldn't preclude them from looking at middle linebacker in the draft. But I think Seattle thinks they have a back seven. I think they have another um, pillar in, on the defensive line and Daryl Taylor, uh, edge rusher. I think that they yes, just need to yes. get Daryl Taylor is good. Yes. I think they just yes. need to draft an edge and sign an edge and or a defensive tackle. Um, and then I think they're, Honestly, I think they're good to go. The reason why I say that is because I know Seattle gave up a lot of yards this year. Um, if you if you you can kind of isolate their strengths and weaknesses on on targets past ten yards, um, EPA per play, the more advanced metrics, they're like top ten across the board, um, and they don't give up very many explosives. That's not because they're playing a prevent defense. I mean, their last year kind of happened under some people's noses. They transitioned to the the Staley defense last year. Like that already occurred. And they brought in some guys that coached in, in that scheme. To me, that shows them doubling down on what they did last year. So firing their coordinator isn't them saying what we did didn't work. It's them saying we want the right guys to coach it and they want to keep their nucleus intact. Um, 
but we'll we'll see what that it's it's all easier said than done so you know you can't just talk about it we'll see what they're they're actually capable of doing um on the offensive side of the ball i think any half decent quarterback thrown to tyler lockett and dk metcalf you're gonna minimum be productive they also acquired noah fant from denver in the trade so um the remaining question really is the offensive line what is promise what isn't promise um Etc. What moves they do or don't make. So, yeah. Um, one, yeah. One question I have a follow up on that is: you say I can't even remember the name of the backup linebacker who you thought was better than Bobby Wagner this year, and I feel like most people still view Bobby Wagner in a very like high regard. And obviously, he made a Pro Bowl this year, didn't he? Or was it yeah. like second team All Pro or no, something? No, I, I, I think you're right. I think you might be right on both um, counts. Yeah. So. What do you think as someone who maybe has watched him a little bit more closely than just like, oh, yeah, Bobby Wagner, stalwart in Seattle? Do you think like what has kind of left his game that has caused him to maybe what, what do you think he brings at this so point in his career? He, so basically he's declining athletically. Last year he declined pretty significantly. However, he didn't decline to the point where like he, he, he didn't reach the threshold of no longer being what he used to be. I thought he was amazing in 2020, like the ultimate like eyes in the back of your head, football IQ, all that stuff, making up for his diminished athleticism. This year, I think he fell off the cliff, cliff athletically to where that all that good stuff just didn't matter anymore. Um, he has had a lingering knee injury every year. He has a, a procedure on his knee. I mean, I think he has a, de- a degenerative knee. I might be wrong on that. And it just finally caught up with him this year. This year. He had a lot of t- um, tackles. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing. It's kind of a function of the defense not being able to get off the field, long drives, a lot right. of snaps. Um, <laughs> but it's, I, I think it, what they thought of Wagner was evidenced by how they schemed him. We didn't see him running with seam routes a lot this year. That was because they knew he wasn't as fast. They, they adjusted the front so that there was as little contact as him as possible. So he was having to move as little laterally as possible. Um, I don't think he's, I don't know if he's a bad linebacker, but this isn't a case of me just saying, oh, he's not what he used to be, but he can still play. I seriously think he completely fell off this year. Um, and a lot of like the all pros and, and, and Pro Bowl selection and votes and stuff was name record, name recognition still helping him a little bit. Um, that said, my praise for Cody Barton is technically a, a, a relative, is relative praise relative to what we saw with Wagner. As soon as they, put Barton in, they were doing all sorts of different things with their middle linebacker in terms of scheme. Like, you know, he's the one carrying receivers down the pipe now. Um, you know, they're, they're tasking him with, with harder coverage, et cetera. So um, I don't know how good Cody Barton is on an absolute scale. That will, that won't, we won't know that unless they actually give him a full season to show it. But um, I, I do know that they traded Cody to replace one of Wagner or they, drafted Cody Barton and traded up for him in the draft to replace one of KJ Wright or Wagner, um, in 2019. So this is, I think they want to see if they were right, um, in their scouting. So cool. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. I didn't watch the Seahawks defense, defense totally enough to, to know exactly what, what his issue or like how yeah. good he still was. So that's, that's interesting to hear for sure. Do you like the return that the Seahawks got back? I saw that Washington made an offer that I thought was, yeah, considerably stronger I, and that he just didn't want to go there. I, I think it's not, I mean, two first, two seconds isn't, isn't terrible. Um, I, I think that, well, it's frustrating because supposedly the bears offered three first last year and I think two seconds or something. So it seems like every year as they approached Wilson's free agency, that the, the value is going to diminish. So maybe they, they had to go for it. It's, it's enough for them to, I don't know. I mean, they got number nine overall, 40 and 41, and then 76. So for their f- first four picks this year, so they can they can add the talent they need, I think, to to uh, maximize their defense, but you still need a quarterback. And this draft is not the draft to really want a quarterback. Um, I, th- I think Ritter is exciting. I understand the hype for Malik Willis, you know, just because he's a- talented and stuff, but he's a project the same way that – Josh Allen was and Justin Herbert, but look, like, look what they ended up doing anyway. So maybe the league thinks, well, we can coach anybody up now if they, so long as they check off enough boxes traits wise. Um, it helps that Herbert and Allen are like 
giraffes and, you know, six, four, six, five, um, Malik Willis <laughs> is, you know, six, one, which isn't short, but it's not super tall. So I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of lukewarm on it. This is not the year to need a quarterback though. That was last year and next year with Stroud and, and Bryce Young. So I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. I mean, you you should be drafting Matt Corral. That's the correct choice. Okay, are, are, so do we got Corral truthers <laughs> in here. I I haven't watched. Uh, we I, had, I'm a okay. Corral we truther. had a okay. Okay. Truther. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I Me don't and know. Theo were Ritter fan. guys. But um, I went to Cincinnati, so so naturally. I'm biased. But Ritter, Ritter is very. Yeah. I, I like Ritter a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is is there? Do you have you started looking at? I don't know if you've started doing any draft look for Seattle at what you want them to do with that ninth pick. Um, probably against my better judgment, I just want them to stick and pick and take the best defensive end that is there because that's what my id wants. I want them to take Thibodeau or Karloftis or whatever at nine, whoever's there. I don't think Hutchinson will be. Probably all three of those guys won't be. Um, uh, Ajabo potentially, yeah. Um, so. I, I could see them trading back. I could see them trading back into the teens and then getting another second or third round pick. Um, it, I don't know if I don't know what the what the valuation is on Willis ter- in terms and Ritter in terms of like draft selection, because even if they like them, what if they think they can get him the second round, right? So I don't. I, I know um, there, there's some hype around Willis going like top five, and that doesn't seem to be happening for Ritter, even though I'm partial to Ritter. So maybe they think, let, let's say hypothetically Ritter's their guy. Do they stick and pick at nine and then take Ritter at 40? Or do they trade back into the teens, take their take the, their favorite quarterback there, and then you know just go crazy at defensive line in the second round? They'll probably have three picks after that hypothetical trade. So I, I don't I, I don't know. Like Part of it's just draft strategy. I don't know how they're trying to distribute their resources there. Um, I can't tell you that I got a laundry list of defensive players I want them to take. Um, but yeah, beyond that, man, I don't, I don't know. This is, this is, they really took the plunge of this trade. Um, so that's, th- there's a lot that can go wrong. So <laughs> we'll just have to see what happens. <laughs> Listen, as a Browns fan, I know what it's like to have a lot that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you, you, you sure do. I got, I got to count my, uh, I got to count my blessings here. It's all relative. <laughs> yeah, at least you have a Super yeah. Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that's all we have on our end. You know, uh, you know. Again, thanks a ton for, sure, for coming yeah. on. It was great having you. Give a uh, a lot of great insight about Seattle, and you know, best of luck to you guys this <laughs> season. Because honestly, you'll probably yeah, need it. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, a lot of luck. Better to be lucky than good. Bingo. Now I don't know about you guys. But I thought that was a pretty fresh. <laughs> Matt, that Russell know? Wilson trade sure was fresh. You know what else is fresh? <laughs> we use the same transition every single week. I, I saw Matt laugh, and I was just like, "Oh my!" Russell Wilson <laughs> is going to so be saying we say, "Hello." Okay, wait, no, 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 no. Oh, we say goodbye to Griff, but we say hello <laughs> to hello, fr- there you go, hello yeah. Fresh. There look, we go. Look at you, Theo. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> look at you. With Hello Fresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Hello Fresh lets you skip the mouth. <laughs> He's just over here <laughs> nodding his oh, head oh, aggressively. Oh, oh. Hello Fresh lets you skip those grocery store trips and makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why I said, you know, it's America's number one meal kit for a reason. HelloFresh cuts out all the stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can just enjoy cooking and get to eating in about 30 minutes or less. Also, HelloFresh is 30% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store. Plus, you get to skip those pesky checkout lines. You can try their quick and easy meals like 15 to 20 minute dinners, breakfast on the go, and 10-minute lunches in the HelloFresh market. Perfect for you if you have a crazy class schedule, an internship, or a new job. You can enjoy restaurant-quality meals for less in the comfort of your own home. With HelloFresh's gourmet recipes like balsamic fig sirloin, they're over 72% cheaper than an average restaurant meal. Time to get some HelloFresh, man. Uh, Just like our guest on the podcast, it's very fresh. What is the cost of like an average restaurant meal? I, I... I had no, a I'm delicious saying, like, meal. Think of a number. I had a delicious meal here in Seattle the other day, and I uh, it cost me like forty dollars, but that was an above fifty dollars, maybe even. But that, that was an above. You're a big spender. Market. I'm a big spender. I'm a high roller here. 
Matt, Matt knows anyway, damn well. I stay hot is cheaper. Here's a little. Here's a little one sec before we get into everything else. Here's a little fact. <laughs> it is not. February is over and Bladen was the ad reader for February. And then we were supposed to do it for another month. Bladen <laughs> loves doing it so much that we can't, we can't read the ads. Uh, so uh, I also like, I don't think I could live up to what Bladen's doing right now. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty Listen, happy. Man, with man, numbers. Will so. numbers. <laughs> Will we got numbers. a lot to talk about. Well, we got a lot hold on, to talk no, no, about no, no, no. though. As, as much as I would love to get into that, um, we have to remind people to use code stay hot 16. Um, go to hellofresh.com slash stay out 16, use the code stay out 16. That is stay hot. The number 16 to get up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash stay hot 16. Use the code stay hot 16 to get America's number one meal kit. Hello fresh. And now on to the freshest trades in the NFL brought to you by the Theo Ash NFL. Well, the first one I think we should talk about, well, the thing that happened, we haven't covered it, but it did happen the same day as the Russ news was, the Aaron Rodgers extension and the Aaron oh, Rodgers yes. extension. I don't have that much to say about it uh, because it's just right. more of the same for yeah. four more years. I would say this. I'm glad it happened. I I am an Aaron Rodgers enjoyer, uh, even with his whole spiel, this, you know, season and the drama. Even I with still Tom foolery, even with his Tom. Look, the dude's a libertarian. All right. That's his thing. <laughs> He's a libertarian and I can live with that. There are NFL players who have done a lot worse. If I have to root for a libertarian, and Joe Rogan anti-vaxxer like I, I don't love it but you know he is a really good quarterback and it's not so, <laughs> look it's not so bad that it's like oh my god I can't root for the guy anymore I'm glad he's back I'm glad he's back he's there for four more years I get that he doesn't have the playoff success that you'd expect from a guy like him but he's still top 10 all time in playoff wins he still has a ring which like basically no other active quarterbacks in the NFL have like more rings than him right now. Like obviously Brady does, but Brady's like the one exception really from the last 40 yeah. years. So Rogers has had as much playoff success as anybody has. I, I think that that gets all overblown. He's a really good quarterback. He's better than Jordan love. That's for sure. And until he proves he's not an MVP, you know, it's hard for me to say he's anywhere near falling off the cliffs because he I just think, won, you know, two straight MVPs. I think that's the big thing with this. Like something's got to happen. Someone's got to take Jordan love. Right. The Packers hold on to first round picks like like they would I think they would love to keep Jordan Love. I really do. Everyone is like, oh, it's a humane thing is to let him go. And oh, it makes so much sense just to let him go. The Packers may not be look the Packers, we are like, oh, Rogers sat for three years. We wow. like have we like having a young high end backup behind him. It would not surprise me if they don't trade him, but obviously trading him makes the most sense. But the other be, thing it's is it's gonna be tempting when the Panthers offer Number six overall. It would be a little tempting. When Kenny Pickett goes at like two or something. I don't think they would want... The thing is, a third round pick's not going to do it. They picked him in the first no. round. They're going to want a first round pick in return. Yeah. If there's an offer, they can't refuse. But I think they still think he has as much value as the day he was drafted. And in a weak quarterback class, it would make me... If, if teams are offering late seconds, I think they say no and say, it's a weak quarterback class. He was a first round pick in a strong quarterback class. Why isn't your first round pick now? Because, you know, he's played like one game. He didn't play like super, super horribly. Like his debut in the Chiefs game wasn't like there have been way worse debuts than that. Right. Yeah, so yeah. no, there has his, it, it's they probably would feel they want the exact same price. So that's my one thing. I, my thing with the Rogers thing has always been like the idea that there's just like all these organizations that are so much better than the Packers because they made this one pick two years ago. It was they drafted a running back and a quarterback, so it's it, it's not that bad in Green Bay. It's, it's great in bad. Green Bay. It's a great team. It's a great franchise. They it's also a great just organization. Franchise tagged the you know one of the best receivers in the yeah, NFL. Devonta Adams this, is coming. All back. All this talk, uh, last dance. It, that looks silly now, not because they <laughs> lost, but because no, it's not. <laughs> it's not the last dance. <laughs> nope. Actually, they're just going to play again. Look, so the casualty here is Zadarius Smith. Um, the casualty people say, oh, the cap. The, people say the cap's not real. The cap is, oh, it's a myth. They're going to lose Zadarius Smith, and that to me is like, I can, I think I can spoil the Euphoria f uh, season finale. It's like in Euphoria, it's like they tease the loss of like the main character Fez, but then like not the main character dies, but like a lesser secondary character that everybody liked, but everyone is a little bit glad like the character they thought was going to die isn't going to die. That happens all the time in TV shows. That's the one that like, 
I think of most immediately was like Ashtray dying in Euphoria, where it's like, oh, that's sad, but at least it's not Fezco. That's how I, I feel about the Packers right now, where it's like, damn, Zadarius is gone. Ah, oh, that that is sad, but at least it's not Rogers and Adams and Gary <laughs> and Preston Smith held it down this year. So, you I'm know, be like, are we in just spoil Euphoria season two territory? It's been like weeks, dude. If you haven't seen it at this point, I haven't seen I, it. We're on season four. I'm not watching it. Season season two, episode four right now. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm totally, I've, my friend is watching it. I'm not watching it also. I know. I, I've Twitter. also seen. Uh, yeah, I've seen you know like. It hasn't been spoiled for me yet. Oh, you, you shouldn't say it. Oh, the Batman. I haven't seen the Batman either. You shouldn't say Although, it because now someone's just going to DM you directly, idiot. That's a good point. Please cut anyway, that out of the podcast. Please, I, I'm dead. Pl- I, I, I really got to go see this movie. I, I need I'm, to go I'm, see I'm it too. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, I'll probably go anyway, see it over spring break. Roger's anyway. back. Good. Zadarius is going to get cut. That's sad, but we've got the guys to to like survive that. Anyway, no one wants to hear about this because it happened months ago. Everybody wants to hear about Chargers, the, Khalil no, Mack. Chargers, Khalil Mack. Actually, no is, one wants to hear about that. Everyone wants to hear about how there's no off season at underdog fantasy <laughs> because, wow. because right now you can draft a 2022 best ball fantasy football team in their big board tournament with $250,000 in cash prizes and $50,000 to first place. Which incoming rookies will you draft to make a splash in your 2022 fantasy team? You can draft your dream fantasy roster in the big board now and that's it. No waivers, no trades, no setting up your lineup. Underdog will give you the optimal score each week and get this. Right now, when you sign up with the code Stay Hot, Underdog is going to match your initial deposit with up to $100 in bonus cash. So what are you waiting for? Go check out underdogfantasy.com or their mobile app and sign up with the code Stay Hot and may the best drafter win. Now, the second thing that people are excited to hear about is, of course, the Chargers making a trade for Khalil Mack. And they didn't even have to give up their first round pick for him. Bravo. I I don't think the Bears got fleeced. They didn't get fleeced. It's they got fleeced they lost the trade. That's the thing. They got fleeced long ago. <laughs> right. That this but, but trade that has nothing to do with this trade right, right now. It just doesn't mean like, yeah, it looks bad now, but that's not how it works. Like Yes, That's total sunk cost fallacy. Type it is sunk cost type fallacy. Deal. It is. Look, he's the, thirty one. Who was? He's yeah. thirty one. He's got seventeen million against the cap. Then twenty, and then twenty something, and then twenty something again. It's an yeah. expensive thirty one year old edge rusher coming off an injury. They sh- yeah to get I mean, a give up a first for that to get a Nobody. second for it is okay. It's fine. No one is giving up a first for that. This is when you trade for Khalil Mack, not when they did it in his prime with Mitch Trubisky at quarterback. It was just the wrong time, I think, to go all in. They had full confidence in Trubisky at that point. The whole thing hinged on the offense working out, and then you have an elite defense to go with it. But they put all their chips on Trubisky, and it didn't work out, and then they had no way to like draft guys to carry Trubisky because they used all their resources on Mack. And well, I'll... I'll- Yes. I mean, I'll say this. I think that you can even look at it. Khalil Mack, like the Bears failing was was more that like they just didn't have a quarterback. And it's like yeah. you just can't miss on a quarterback in a year where there's two guys who could have been good enough yeah. and you had the highest pick and you know, picked the one the highest. Yeah. That the, the the problem with the Khalil Mack trade isn't that it didn't work. It did. Their defense was awesome. It's that you missed on the quarterback. Yeah. You went all in when you didn't have the quarterback and you just can't do that. It worked with Jalen, Ram- like Jalen Ramsey was a guy you traded first two first round picks for him. Right. And it wouldn't have worked. Like it wouldn't have been worth it if they stayed with golf, yeah. like that you wouldn't have won anything and you would have just given up first round picks, but they went all in again and like have, don't have a first round pick for an historically like long amount of time. It works when you have the quarterback. And I guess in Seattle, Jamal Adams got taken and and they had Russ. Well, the Adams trade was just insane. The Adams trade was a little insane, and also Adams didn't play as well in Seattle as he had in New York. That's not a problem with Mac, who was as good as ever, and Jalen Ramsey, who's as good as ever. With Jamal Adams, like maybe it would have worked out if he was the guy that he was billed to be, but he, right. he really hasn't been. But um, I yeah, I have to say when when it comes to the Chargers, it's like I've seen some people like, oh, Super Bowl hype. I agree. They I'm, have added I'm, one player, but, but it's such an important player. I think like Khalil Mack, a healthy Khalil Mack is one of 
the best def- like run defending edge rushers in the entire league. Like the way the strength that he has and the way he can he can free up linebackers on double teams and just like when he just crashes inside and frees up those those like line- yeah when he crashes inside he just annihilates offensive tackles and frees up the linebackers to an insane degree. So for the Chargers, the Chargers traded for him at the right time when they have a quarterback they know is good, when they have a good offense. And now you've just started, you got a second round pick and you have all this cap room. You just gave up your second round pick for maybe the best, like just aside from what he does as a pass rusher, they don't even need what he does as a pass rusher, I don't think. Yeah. They just need what he has as a run defender, really. Like the pass rushing is gr- okay, great. Um, but Khalil Mack has never been like the most productive sack guy like if you look at his like in his time in chicago like the sacks aren't he had he had six and seven last last two yeah 13 sacks he's like and he's hurt he had six and seven games but like just what he adds as a run defender is going to be so huge for them because that's what they need and i really i think like and they're not done either like they still have that first round pick dude if they take jordan davis with their first round pick and it's Mac Davis and Bosa, Bosa. or if yeah. they add Sebastian Joseph Day, who's a really great run defender and was like a key part of of Staley's defense, dude, their run def- defense all of a sudden goes from like a ma- like a total liability to just a massive strength, and that combined with the offense, we talked about Mike Williams and bl- like Blade and I know that you weren't high on them resigning them at all, which I think is it, I think is you're crazy. I mean, we for can, that. we can get into that. I just. Listen, would you rather have Mike Williams for three years or 60 million McChickens? Like, let, let's get, <laughs> like, what is it? Like, let's, let's be real. real. Like, let's, that let's, doesn't, let's be real. Me. <laughs> you're taking the McChickens. I'm sorry. No, you're not. I'm like, no offense. Like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> if that is your, if I that is, say, I would say, as far as football goes, I trust one Mike Williams to have more receptions. Right. I, for a football team, I'd rather have Mike Williams, but they needed to re sign Mike Williams because. If you don't resign Mike Williams, that's just like okay. Wh- who are you replacing? Like you needed to do. You needed to do it. You're in win know. now mode. You my, can't create another. I would weakness. have tagged them. Yeah, my my. I don't. I don't have a problem. Like with like okay, you need to have him on your team. Fine, because your offense would just get worse. But again, you're not. You're not. Do, you haven't changed your offense at all. Your offense is the exact same. That's good. They were the second best offense in the league last year. You want it to but, but, be the exact same. I don't know. When I when I think of like my my concern is like when you stay the same, a lot of times you get worse. And I'm I not don't think s- that's true. And I'm not saying that they're gonna be like an average to below average offense. I still think they'll be good, but maybe they're not gonna be top two. Maybe if they were all like 35, I would say, if you say that. But like, how often has they, like, the receivers I, led the league? They had the second best offense, and the receivers led the league in drops. I don't think that bodes well. It's like with with um, like a, a team that or uh, an edge defender that gets a lot doesn't of, bother me that much. The drop number think doesn't it, bother me it, that it much. Does bother me and a plus, if bit. they're going to regress, it's going to be to regress positively, and they're going to have less drops last next I year. Don't know. I, I I just think like oh. you see production but drops. That reminds me a lot of seeing a lot of sacks but not a lot of pressures. I I think that makes zero sense. No maybe offense. maybe I I, I think I it's the get, opposite. May, I just get this feeling that they're not going that that's not going to pan out as well as it as it should. I, I still think, I think they'll be fine. My my one thing with the Chargers is like. I want to at least see them make the other moves before I'm like, they're winning the Super Bowl. Right. It's like, oh, the Chargers are perfect if they do these exact moves. There is zero guarantee that they do those things, though. Yeah. I I, I trust them to do those things. I think, like, Fair enough, like I, I trust totally them like, to do those things. I think they're on such Gilmore a... Gilmore and, and Davis, are, this isn't like some, like, pipe dream no, or anything no. that people have about them. Yeah. And I agree 100% with the run defense. Although, if you get Jordan Davis, I'll be honest with you. I think the odds of Jordan Davis, Joey Boza, and Khalil Mack playing a ton of snaps together is not a guarantee yeah. either. With you sure. know how often Davis is off the field, and now Mack is maybe you know coming off an injury, and Joey Bosa is always injured, dude. I mean, well, not always. He played yeah. sixteen games last year, but but on, you know, he's, on the bright he's, side he's, of that, if of you have all of those guys, right? You're you're used to being in a, in a scenario where it's like. Oh, Bosa got hurt. Oh, Derwin James got hurt. Now we have no one on our defense. Now it's like, okay, let's say Bosa goes down. 
Okay, we're putting, well, now we have Jordan Davis and Khalil Mack. Okay, let's say Jordan Davis needs a break. Okay, well, now you have Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, right? You still I, have I, guys there. I also think Jordan Davis's conditioning is not quite as big of a problem as people think it is. No, I don't think so because, either. Because but. Georgia's defensive line is deep as hell, man. So it's like, <laughs> if he's feeling like, he, if well. he's feeling like 90 or 85%, why not just sub in? someone at like yeah. Trav- like Trevon Walker exactly. like exactly. so so the fact that he played so little snaps is also just because they had the luxury of just being able to do that um I remember in the national championship game he played like a good like a pretty good amount of snaps there so I think so I'm a big, yeah, was, big was, Jordan Davis fan I like I think is is that's the I mean that's the yeah. dream pick I think for the Chargers at 17 it's just high enough makes sense I it's not a Valuable position. Yeah, don't care. I, th- I think it's yeah, incredibly valuable I don't position, care. especially no. after that. Especially after that, um, that combine that he had when he tested as. Like, I mean, it's just the like, most athletic like the, defensive the player. Most I mean, if anything, if you, if anything, fun, you have to be yeah. scared that someone might take him sooner. Yeah, just because of how athletically gifted he is. It's funny how the combine changes that because, like before, before I was like, oh, maybe he doesn't play enough snaps, and then the combine happened, and I'm like, oh, right. Yeah, it's like I'm reminded either. that he's an unmovable object with like, <laughs> like also sideline to sideline <laughs> speed, and people talk about like the sack production. It's like Vince Wilfork had three and a half sacks max in his career. Uh, to me, Jordan Davis is like the next Vince Wilfork, and Vince Wilfork and, yeah, was like, like a Hall can, of Fame. If you're taking up, if you're taking up two blockers. It also uh, lets, that's gonna be a big, big problem when you got Khalil Mack on one side and you got Joey Boza on the yeah. other. It's a big problem for anyone because it's also like, okay, if you if you feel confident with your run game with him out there, you can put however many people you want in coverage, and that's gonna get, create coverage sacks. So even if he's not yeah. sacking the quarterback, it's other people anyway. This Jordan Davis hasn't even happened yet since <laughs> the charge, but like whoever gets Jordan Davis is a good move, but. I, I think that the Chargers are going to be legitimate Super Bowl contenders. Uh, I think that they I are. I just want to see it before. Yeah, I, they definitely have to make some it, more moves. Uh, Khalil Mack alone is not enough to take you from the playoffs to the Super Bowl, I don't think. Yeah. But obviously, they've, they're they going to make other moves. But you never know with teams. You never know. I agree. Yeah. Uh, the the other move, obviously, is is um, Wentz to Washington, yes. which is like the grossest, most disgusting That's trade. Right. I see a lot of people. A lot of people are like... They would. I saw a lot of people like Washington fans say they would rather have Heineke. I get that. It moves the Super Bowl needle for them zero in my eyes. Like yeah, I would, I would rather have Heineke than pay Wentz thirty million. I guess, I guess, I guess I in know. that it's regard, like, as far as like paying him, yeah. But I think he's better. How did they? I think dude, he's better. Like, <laughs> I don't know, what, what the hell are the Colts going to do at quarterback? If they move to Garoppolo, it's just going to be the most like sloppy garbage trade like <laughs> swap yeah. of all time you go from right now they're up but it's not complete yet they yeah gotta they go gotta get go get guy. another guy if they were to like Even draft if they Kirk cousins if, i'd be like okay. if they go in like draft ritter or something in the second round yeah. bang you, they, bang you just moved on from I whence mean, you, you can, got someone good i think and but like yeah i don't know what like Washington, there's su- like I don't know exactly if the line moved in Vegas for them to win the Super Bowl. I would bet it didn't move one bit. And you're moving like day two picks, like multiple day two picks to do what exactly to get closer Dude, to the, what the, closer the Carson, to what? the Carson Wentz leading Washington to the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> like timeline, I don't think it's out there. If there's odds on it in Vegas, it's out oh, there. It's, it's definitely out <laughs> We might not be living in it, but it exists. I, it does exist, but I, I just think he's like... He's playing like it's 2017. He is better than Heineke, and he's... It's good for McLaurin, though. It is good for McLaurin. He, he is better than Heineke, in my opinion. And Wentz, after losing that Jaguars yes. game, his stock is at an all-time low. He's yes. not like this total... He wasn't this like total liability with, with Indianapolis last year. But the thing with Wentz is he's just... Not good enough to win four games that are like must win. Just inconsistent. He's just it's inconsistent. Just the consistency. And it's not only the inconsistency, but when he's bad, dude, he is bad. He'll lose you playoff t- uh, chances over yeah. against the Jets. I've, I've never seen a GM and an owner as mad at a, their starting quarterback as as <laughs> the Colts were for Wentz. They were like basically just like but openly being like, yeah, he he blew it for us and he he's gone. Like that's literally what like, but basically like were, what they were saying. Were there problems like in the preseason? I heard that there were like... That, yeah, he got hurt. 
he got no, hurt. Not he was even, an anti vax Yeah, like he was just he was like a problem. <laughs> like I don't He's know. He's a problem for the Eagles. Like he apparently he like told when he was hurt and they won the Super Bowl. I mean, word on the street is he was telling his teammates, I'm mad that they're successful without me. And that's just a horrible leadership. And what the you, you have to be a good leader to be a quarterback. And obviously, yeah. I wasn't there. Maybe people are just making stuff up. But, I mean, it ended poorly in in Philadelphia. Everyone, No one really liked him, it seemed, by the time he left there. No one really, at least the front office, didn't really like him in, in Indy by the time that he got yeah. there. And they were, like, r- clearly regretted trading what they did for Wentz. And then Washington is going to trade for it, like, third time's a charm, I guess. So, yeah, And if the know. Colts, like, get Garoppolo, it, like, that seems to be, like, a pretty a match that everybody is talking about, then you're just like, they l- moved laterally too. Like that doesn't help them at all either. So it's just a bunch of slop with the Colts in Washington. And I, I don't, it doesn't move yeah, me. I don't know. It's like, I think it gives Washington a little bit. I don't think it's a total lateral move because at least when, when he's good, gives your offense at least some, some juice. You versus, can make the playoffs with versus, yeah. versus, happened before. versus Heineke. I don't as much as I want as much as I wanted to have some faith in Heineke. He just he didn't have it. Yeah. Heineke has yeah. got a weird it's devil so- magic where like he <laughs> is going to be a really good backup for a long time. He's got that weird like he's, he's got that Fitz magic. He's got the it's crazy he's got how the Fitz Washington magic. has two Ryan Fitzpatrick's <laughs> on their team. They really do. But yeah. Um yeah, it's just like you look at that movie and you're like, is this something that a team that is going to win the Super Bowl would do? And the answer is probably not. Is this something that a, a really good team would do? Probably not. So it's whatever. It's not the end of days as most moves that aren't that great are. But um, it's it's not life changing. It's not life changing. You know, it is life changing, though. Hello, Fresh. No. <laughs> I won't, I won't do that to you guys again. Um, well, I think that about wraps things up for us today. It does. As always, <laughs> thank you all for tuning in. Um, tons and tons of content will be coming away on all platforms. We will be back Sunday, Monday. Yes, Monday to preview, you know, kind of the rest of the NFL free agency, hit on some NBA topics probably. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back then. Don't miss out on all the great t- content coming to win all platforms. Make sure make sure you call in for the Stay Hot shout out. Uh, I see Theo over there with the camera taking a picture for his trip. Make sure you call him for the Stay Hot shout out. Let us know, uh, you know, if you're a team that made a trade. Make let us know if you're happy, sad. If your favorite NBA team's playing, let us know how you're feeling. If you're a baseball fan, we don't care. Uh, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> L baseball. <hate. laughs> Never mind. You know what? As always, from yeah, yeah, I want, the, yeah, I want the players to be able to go yeah, play. They, they go, is, yeah, the like, players not, can I'm go not, play, but I'm not going to watch. We've been to a baseball game. Before, yes, Blade. we had a good time. Yeah, I, going to a baseball game. It's not a. It's just okay. It's just not a football or a basketball game. It's a different yeah, thing. It is. And like, you're right. I can get ten dollars. I can get ten cent hot dogs at, at at a baseball game. I can't do that. At, they don't. <laughs> they do. Yeah. Theo's over here. Is Mike is Mike, cut yeah, out. Yeah, that's why we're. Just, you can get ten cent hot dogs at Clippers games. Yeah, man. you can get ten cent hot it dogs. Rules. I have a great park. Yeah, that, that was cool. But as always, from Corn Boy, Bird Boy, and Lemon Boy, we will catch y'all on the flippity flop. <laughs>